So um, this is a tag team talk between myself and Li Ping Wang and um, Victoria Lim in my group, who is um, going to be talking some about some some work we've doing, been doing in this area as well. Um, so, but part of this is is quite simple. So for valence parameters, this is the other part of the the bonded terms aside from torsions. A lot of it just is going to rely on force balance. Um, but so here's here's the big picture again. So this, in some sense, becomes basically part of what we're talking about is basically part of the um, the fitting process inside the the parameter optimizer, specifically the part for um, valence terms and relating to chemical perception as well. So right now, where we stand in Smirnoff ninety nine frost, which is our starting point small molecule force field, we have eighty seven bond stretch parameters that covers basically all the chemistry we cover, and just 38 angle bend parameters, which is quite small, and probably that's a little too small in some cases. So I think for, for rings, in many cases, we've re relied on the geometry of the ring to set, or the geometric constraints on the ring to set its shape, and so we have perhaps fewer angle parameters than we might end up needing. Um, but also it deals with a lot of the, the duplicate parameters that force fields otherwise have just by using the better form of, of chemical perception. So we don't have thousands and thousands of duplicate lines. So we think this means it's a really good starting point for, for fitting, for refitting these, these parameters and in some cases perhaps adding a few more. Um, so we, we aren't going to anymore see these hundreds and hundreds of lines of exactly the same thing in slightly different combinations of atom types. So we expect that a pretty simple approach is going to give us significant improvement. Um, well, that is behind the graphic. But uh, so we're going to start off by basically refitting all of the valence parameters using the current chemical perception. So without changing the typing, we're just going to be refitting these using force balance. We'll also, if we identify cases where we have major problems, like we need an additional parameter for a ring system or whatever, then we can modify the chemical perception by hand. That could be the case for some ring internal ang angles where we need to add some other ones. So we'll be running lots of quantum mechanics, calculations, geometry optimizations, and so on for a good size molecule set to refit these. Um, and that's sort of the first phase that will come before going on to, to adjusting the chemical perception more. So, so basically, there's sort of three generations of, of valence parameters that we imagine. So the first one will be getting the infrastructure working. So we'll just be refitting selected valence parameters, those that seem especially problematic or high priority without changing the chemical perception. And so Vicky in a minute is gonna talk some about how we're identifying some cases that are either particularly problematic or particularly informative for refitting to prioritize for that first generation. And, and as you get your hands on this and start trying things out, if you identify cases you think are particularly problematic or particularly informative, we'd like your input. Then the second phase is we'll have all that infrastructure working for fitting these, and then we'll be refitting all of the valence parameters with fixed chemical perception, though possible, possibly some, some high priority fixes to the chemical perception that would come in by hand. Um, and then the th third generation would be refitting all the valence parameters with um, the Kemper-based chemical perception, so automatically determining which types we should have. Um, and so we think probably something like less, a hundred or less bond and angle parameters will take us through the first two generations of this. And, and generation one is mostly what I'm going to be talking about right now because that's most of the infrastructure work. Generation two and three is basically just more of the same. Um, so a lot of the infrastructure, the construction, this construction picture um, has to do with the generation one. Um, so. We're going to go over a bit of the detailed plans here that, that sort of roughly fall into this. Generation one is refitting selected valence parameters. So we're going to select the molecule library with particularly informative molecules, then have a do conformer generation. Um, there's some work we need to do on QC archive to get it to interface with this. Um, and on geometric and force balance, and Li Ping will talk about that. Uh, we also want to project vibrational frequencies onto internal coordinates to help with some of this, and, and Li Ping is going to talk about that. Then we'll refit the parameters. And in the meantime, we're also building infrastructure and concepts for fitting impropers. We're going to make a, a broader use of improper torsions than most force fields we've been using have in the past. 
And um, we'll talk about that for a minute. So then generation two, we're just going to use that to, instead of do selected valence parameters, we're going to do all of the valence parameters um, and also start using impropers a lot more. And then generation three will be refit them with chemical perception that is data driven. So Vicky, you want to jump in here? Or the podium mic, I think, works better. As part of our G1 goals, we want to develop an initial molecule set in order to fit these force fields. So you can imagine that um, if you put in a force field with only carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, and oxygens, you can't expect to use it to simulate something with sulfur or phosphorus. Um, so here, this talk is this project is not focused on the black box, the force field parameterization scheme, but sort of what molecules we want to build, to put into it to develop this new force field. So we want to focus on this orange circle of molecules and we want to identify particularly informative chemistry. And here we're focused on geometry structures that are not consistently represented by different force fields. So this is a project that is mostly done by an undergrad in the lab named Jordan Ehrman and um, co-advised by Caitlin Bannon. So basically, if you imagine all force fields in the limit of perfection, then they will minimize in gas phase to the same structure. So in one case, we have a, this dark green force field. And then in force field two, we have this light green. And if you overlay, they should be indistinguishable. But in reality, force fields are not consistent for all of chemical space. Um, so you might have these um, differences in specific torsions and rings. And these are the chemistries we want to find because force fields are not applicable for everything you want to simulate. So the goal is to identify sets of molecules that are minimized to different geometries by different force fields. And so we're not taking any specific force field as the right answer, but we are comparing different pairs of input force fields to see how they compare. And to, by doing this project, we can develop better force fields by expanding the space of um, chemistry that is covered. So um, this is our brief workflow of what we're doing. So we're looking at two molecule sets, drug bank and e-molecules. Um, we are limiting ourselves to molecules less than 200 heavy atoms, and we are also not considering metals. Um, we are using the same fixed charge set for all of them with the AM1BCC partial charges. And then with the same input structure, we have gas phase minimizations for GAF, MMFF94, and 94S. OPLS 2005 and Smirnoff. Thanks. Uh, so two questions actually. One, one is how, how are you making sure you're getting the same minima, right? Because because this only this is only true if you're in the global minima for the molecules concerned, because th there's going to be multiple different conformations that are available that you'll probably minimize too. And then the second is, is looking at the predicted optimized structure of the best option versus say, might it be better to compare the Hessian matrix? So, so to look at like a predicted IR spectra or something between different force fields for the same molecule. Okay, so to answer your first, so your first question was on um, how do you know you're getting to the correct local minima? So we're just starting with initial confirmations and we're just going to the local minima. So we're just basically seeing, checking that the local minima will be the same and seeing from the same starting structure if they will get to the same point. Right, but I, 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 cases, I don't think that's guaranteed. In some cases they end up being different and we sort of pay less attention to those basically. But we're, we're looking for ones where they basically got to something like the same minimum, but it's different. So what would you, I mean, could you minimize with one full field and then take that as the input structure that you then minimize with the other full fields to see if they move away from that minimum that it's in? Okay. 
Yeah. And then the second question was around, yeah, is it not better to look at second derivatives rather than actual structures? Yes, we could do that probably in sort of a later stage of this project. Also part of this is about, you know, so the force fields aren't going to give us the right answer. This is a, partly about figuring out which molecules we're most interested in, or which chemistry we're most interested in doing more work on in the immediate term. Cool. So it's a quick way to check. Where's the mic coming? I think this is a nice idea, and I, I wouldn't think you'd need to worry so much about local minima, at least with the sorts of structures you're showing here. Um, and also, if you don't get to the same local minima starting from the same structure, that's informative too. Um, I might suggest that you look at Allinger's work and include the MMX force fields, because in his work, first of all, he's, he's got a wide coverage of interesting compounds, so you could get some information from that. And also, he's documented with each of his force fields, MM1, MM2, and MM3, he's documented problematic systems. So you might look, you might add his problematic systems to your database, and it would be very impressive if you could uh, alleviate some of the problems that he's found. Thank you for that suggestion. Okay, so the way we are scoring, oh, sorry. It's also just came to mind the database um, of minimized QM structures. Uh, I think it's GDB9 or something like that. That might be also useful as a comparison. Okay, so the way we are scoring these uh, molecules are two metrics. One is Tanamoto Combo, which is, uses a combination of shape and cover, color overlays for the molecule, as well as something called torsion fingerprint deviation, which measures the basically the torsion, tor torsion deviation that is topologically weighted so that central deviations have higher weight than terminal torsions. So we um, use um, a normalized version of Tani, um, of Tanimoto Kondo called Tani Diff, um, where we want to look for a low Tani Diff and a high TFD score. Um, so I'm just showing a few example molecules that we saw from e-molecules, where these had a higher number of differences among pairwise comparisons of force fields. So just showing the aromatic ring on the bottom first, we see that aligning by the six-member ring, there is um, variation in the planarity of the five-membered ring. Um, so here we have GAF in yellow, GAF2 in pink, MMFF94, which is the same structure as MMFF94S in gray, and then Smirnoff in cyan. So we see this range that is shown on the right here. And um, with this double ring case, we have this cyclobutyl connected to the cyclopropyl. And you can see that if we align by the four-membered ring, these three force fields, GAF, MMFF94, and Smirnoff, place the three-membered ring at a different orientation compared to the four-membered one. And then finally, with this compound um, here on the middle image, I'm turning off the hydrogen so you can better see that we again have a different, um, different represented planarity structure um, of this ring compared to the two nitrogens that are aligned. So we are not, we don't conclude, these are just preliminary results. We don't really have much to conclude from them. But the next step in this project is to group these molecules by chemical similarity. In other words, can we say, are there particular functional groups that are more poorly represented by these force fields and they're less consistent among these different force fields? So from these molecules, we will build this set in order to, um, that will lead to the next stage of generating perturbed confirmations of these molecules to 
then interface with the third step with geometric and force balance to fit valence parameters. So I think this is the end if anybody has any more questions. The end of that part at least. We can take oh, more yeah. questions on at the end too. Um, okay, so this is Li Ping, right? Yeah, so part of that is, um, you know, if we're gonna do sort of a limited amount of uh, a parameterized on a pretty limited molecule set to begin with, we also like to add some value at the same time. So if we can identify regions that are not well described by current force fields and prioritize those in the first round, we're, no, we're gonna know we're doing something interesting and worthwhile in that first round. All right, um, oh, John. Just a quick question, when you say vibrational frequencies, is that lose their, oh, sorry. Sorry, I'll wait till you're <laughs> done. Ah, okay, okay, sure. Yeah, there, there'll there'll be a there'll be a slide or two on that. Um. Okay. Um. So uh. So in so in my portion of the talk, I will describe a procedure for generating a quantum chemical data set to fit the generation one valence parameters and. Um, and at least my initial expectation is that this plan should carry us into generation two and generation three. We'll just generate more data. Okay. And, um, and so, um, um, so we think valence parameters should be optimized to reproduce three types of properties from quantum chemistry calculations. Um, well, at least these three. So the, um, so gas phase minimum energy geometries that uh, Victoria just talked about. Um, and um, um, vibrational frequencies from a vibrational analysis and, and then potential energy scans along certain degrees of freedom where you expect the deformations to be larger. So I'm just going to refer to these as soft degrees of freedom. Um, and, um, and while these calculations are, um, you know, are ones that we can run on our machines or clusters at an individual scale, creating these data sets and fitting parameters on the scale needed to optimize the small molecule force field is going to require a tighter integration of the software components. So the, uh, so, so here are the software pieces that um, that we're going to use that um, were initially introduced yesterday, and um, and some additional coding and infrastructure is needed to help the components really talk to each other and work together. And um, in the next few slides, I'm going to um, I'm just going to kind of highlight what still needs to be done using uh, you know using underlines. So um, um, so first for a uh, um, so first, let's take a look at gas phase minimum energy geometries. Um, force balance already implements a target to fit parameters to minimize the RMSD of a minimized structure to a quantum mechanical reference. Um, and, the, uh, and the existing procedure is you basically you prepare the target first, which includes the, um, which includes the minimized structure from quantum chemistry. And then you go through the standard force balance procedure that you write the force field file with the current value of your parameters, run the molecular mechanics minimization with a very tight energy threshold, which is usually not costly because you're just minimizing a small molecule. And then um, you compute the RMSD to your QM structure and you add it to the objective function. And then you can compute derivatives of the RMSD with respect to your force field parameters simply with finite difference. And then, um, and there kind of is a problem here that RMSD does not properly penalize geometry errors evenly across parameter types because an RMSD is kind of like a global metric of geometry difference. If you have one degree of freedom that, lead, um, that, that leads to the overall shape of the molecule changing, like for example, if you have a torsion in the middle of a large molecule, that could lead you to a very large RMSD, whereas if you're wrong in a, in a bond length, that will lead to a very short RMSD, as, il as illustrated by the, by the two figures down here, where um, on the left side, you have a large RMSD and it's on the small, um, and on the right side, borrowing Victoria's figure, you have a small one. So we want an objective function that is a little bit more representative of, uh, of differences in individual, um, like valence type degrees of freedom. Um, so, um, um, so this target is not implemented yet, but, um, but I have, uh, but I have a plan for it that is described here. Um, so the, um, so the way the, this target is going to be implemented is the following, that um, the, um, the top level organization is that, um, is that each target had, can have one or more properties. And here, um, and here we're going to have, a, have three groups of terms for, um, for bond lengths, angles, and if I group improper torsions into, into the valence, um, um, the improper is going to be a third group. 
And because uh, deviations in bond length and angles and dihedrals all have different physical units, we um, uh, we normalize each we normalize each term, right? So reasonable norm normalization for uh, deviations in bond length being 0.1 angstroms, for example. Um, and um, and here I've just shown you the first term in the sum, but the second and third term are just strictly analogous to the first term, so there's really no need to show them. Um, and, um, and so the first sum is going to be over groups of bonds where grouping is determined by the Smirnoff parameter assignment. So we're going to use the force field to define the target in a sense that when we are measuring um, errors in the bond length with, with respect to QM, we're going to put them into different bins as determined by the Smirnoff parameter assignment. Um, and, then, um, and then the second sum that is inside the first one is over bonds that are within a group. Okay, um, and the reason why we um, structure the sum in this way is that certain bonds are going to be assigned much more often than other ones. Like for example, an aliphatic CH bond is going to appear many, many more times than, um, than I don't know, a sulfur nitrogen bond, for example. And you might not want your objective function to be dominated by a particular type of bond that appears many, many times in your molecule set. And the nesting structure of the sum here really is just intended to ensure that every bond type contributes by roughly the same amount. Okay, um, and that's and that's pretty much all there all there is to it. Okay, the um, expect this implementation should be pretty straightforward. Okay, um, next moving on to uh, vibrational frequencies. Um, force balance does have an existing vibration target. Okay, um, and the um, and, and the way and the way this works is that you still um, you start with your target preparation, which means you minimize the energy. You follow by a vibrational analysis and. Um, and and force balance is able to well has a has a script to convert you know different types of vibrational output from quantum chemistry programs into a common format that it likes to read, and then um, and then after you parameterize the molecular mechanics system, you compute the molecular mechanics vibrational modes and frequencies. Um, and even though our ultimate goal is to fit the frequencies, you have the problem that the vibrational modes are not exactly the same. So an assignment step is performed first um, to assign. A molecular mechanics vibrational mode to the closest corresponding quantum vibrational mode before you compute the objective function in the uh, um, which is a least squares quantity in the frequency difference um, and um, and in practice using you know a conventional uh, by by conventional I mean the functional forms that you're that we're using we're able to re to reproduce frequencies to within a hundred to two hundred um, wave numbers, and even though this isn't a very exact reproduction, um, I think that the vibrational frequencies are mainly important to make sure that your force constants don't go too far away from physically motivated values. Um, and um, um, and so, um, the the additional code that needs to be uh, that needs to be added to make this part work is that OpenMM does not natively support vibrational mode calculations. Um, and I think vibrational modes tends to be a slightly more esoteric feature in molecular mechanics codes. Not all of them have it. Um, Amber does have the end mode program, but I think it's pretty old. Um, um, some folks in the audience there will have a better idea of that than me. Um, and then, um, and, and so basically we need to implement a vibrational analysis for OpenMM, but that should be straightforward. Um, Force balance has a wrapper code around OpenMM in order to execute the OpenMM simulation. So we'll just implement it in there. Yeah, question. If you're going to fit vibrational frequencies um, analogous to the a previous question, you're obviously calculating the Hessian. And presuma so presumably you could fit the Hessian as was suggested. Mm -hmm. And if your quantum program gives you analytical Hessians, it may be far more efficient than leaving them out. You get a lot of free information. I mean, it's taking force balance one step further. Um, excellent point. And we could and we could certainly implement a target to fit the Hessian. The um, the the choice to fit vibrational frequencies instead of Hessians was a. Uh, um, um, I can I can kind of hand wave that justification, but um, but the point is that if you fit vibrational frequencies, mm -hmm. you're only fitting the minimum energy <laughs> structure, the Hessians minimum energy. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting, and I think 
previous question referred to, mm -hmm. is you could fit Hessians all along the scan. Mm -hmm. and those are, and also just a philosophical point, but mm -hmm. the, the vibrational frequencies in Hessians are the curvature of the, the surface. Mm -hmm. So they are as relevant to the force field as first derivatives and energies. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the curvature right, then the force field is going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. else. I think Chris has a coupled comment or question. Uh, different, different, com different question. Oh, okay. So, it, it, do we want further discussion I, on this? I have a comment on that. Um, you may have a comment on that. Um, my, my, my quick, my quick comment is, um, um, is we, is, is we should include Hessians, and there's no reason why, um, why we would need to choose either Hessians or vibrations. We could certainly do both, and there's much added value to including a Hessian. So, we should do it. I guess what I was going to suggest um, is that it seems to me that by fitting to the Hessian, let's say at the at the energy local energy minimum, one does avoid the mode chorus having to decide which mode goes with which, and that mm -hmm. could get messy in some cases, I imagine, or uh, ambiguous. It, it can it, it can um, it, it can get messy, and I and I, I agree that if you can perfectly reproduce the Hessian, you've also perfectly reproduced the modes, and the reason why we do the mode decomposition initially is because it gives you some extra emphasis on the low frequency modes because the low frequency modes come from small numbers in the hessian whereas the valleys in the hessian are probably dominated by the stiffer degrees of freedom such as the bonds so we thought by doing the eigen decomposition you actually um you actually get to explicitly see what the low frequency modes look like and target them directly and that is what i think is the added value of the of doing the vibrational analysis so it's interesting so i guess i wonder i never thought about this before but but if you diagonalize it right uh -huh. i mean then you can still see which you could still in principle i suppose try to match the diagonalized components as opposed to doing mode overlays i don't know um if you if if you uh if if you diagonalize the qm hessian and then you diagonalize the mm hessian and then you fit the diagonalized components then we are essentially well, doing the and also the eigenvector uh if we just put them in order then is that the same thing as mode matching um yeah i i think that i think that if we order the eigenvalues um i mean i think that if we order the eigenvalues then we are basically doing a mode matching in terms of increasing frequency i think um Alberto had something, and then Chris, and then we should come back to Arnie. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure I caught your remark, but you don't need to diagonal. If you're fitting Hessians, you don't need to diagonalize, and you have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence between. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go to Alberto and then Chris. Uh, just a comment. Are you looking at forces as well? Because I see only the second derivatives here, and no. ah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a um, there's there's a there's a third target that I, that I'm going to get to soon. Yeah. Um, so what was really nice with your uh, uh, previous slide about you can look at the equilibrium geometries and you can partition that out amongst the in, in, internal degrees of freedom where you're fitting the equilibrium values directly. You get a di direct comparison to a force field parameter mm -hmm. with the vibrational frequencies and or even the diagonalized Hessian. You can know that your vibrational frequency is off, or but it's much harder to attribute that to a specific parameter. So, mm -hmm. um, how are you going to? I, I, like this will give kind of a global readout mm -hmm. on the quality of your force field, mm -hmm. but it's going to be hard to focus it on a specific parameter. Do you have any plans there? Can you project that in somehow? Yeah. So this so this is not so so this is something I didn't directly think about before, but there will be a related slide coming up. I think you could translate your Hessian into the internal coordinates, and um, and we have a lot of the and we have most of the code in place for doing that. All, all we all, we we just don't have the we just don't have the second derivatives of internal coordinates with respect to Cartesian coordinates, but um, but 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 we can certainly do that, and it might be a better I idea. I think there's also that. slightly a larger point, which is that like the vibrational frequencies will be coupled to the Leonard Jones, for example. So you don't necessarily want to be fitting your valence parameters to get the vibrational frequencies right if the difference in vibrational frequencies is coming from a steric class, right? So, so that's something that we have to just be aware of and keep coming back to, especially there'll be this coupling. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. If you transform your Hessian matrix into internals, 
you can look at it and get the bond, the bonds, the force constant. Mm -hmm. That is the force constant matrix. Mm -hmm. so you can good, Except for the, in some sense that it, it's the force constant in a way that is coupled intimately to the, the non-bonded parameters as well, the Lennertons or whatever. Yeah, actually, if, if you look at, um, at your, right, and if you look at um, Krim's work, um, he does a very nice, he has a very nice trick where given the non-bond, he subtracts the second derivative matrix of the non-bond out of the quantum Hessian and then you're left exactly as you're saying with just the internal. So he reads off the force constants by subtracting off. I need, I need somebody on Slack to write down this ref, write down the name of this person to our valence channel. Who is it again? Sam Krim. Sam Krim. Okay. The SDFF force field. Okay. So we should look at that. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, All right. It's really so let's plunge ahead then. Okay. Uh, um, the, the, the third and let's, let's see, I, I, I guess these, I guess these animated GIFs might not be, might not be playing just because, uh, um, okay. All right. Well, it's, it's playing now. Okay. Um, so, um, so the, so the third, so the third type of target is, uh, um, is these energy scans along the softer degrees of freedom. So, um, so the, so the vibrational analysis is mainly, um, intended to cover the majority of the, um, I guess, uh, um, the majority of displacements that you that you expect to be, you know, um, relatively relatively stiff, where you don't get larger displacements. So, but you might have a, um, but you might have anharmonic effects and coupling along those degrees of freedom where larger displacements are are expected. Okay, so um, um, so here, so this is so this is just um, just an example of a of a calculation where uh, um, where Jessica in and David Mobley's lab provided this molecule, and we used geometric to scan along an angle and an improper dihedral um, degree of freedom, producing this uh, two-dimensional potential energy map. And this is the kind of thing that you might um, that that you might be interested in fitting parameters to, um, and seeing how important the anharmonic contributions might be. Um, and so, um, so the initial plan is to use geometric to produce these one-dimensional or two-dimensional scans, working with QC Archive to deploy the calculations at at scale and, uh, and retrieving the data. Um, but, uh, but if you have a large set of molecules, say if you have a few thousand, it might not be straightforward to identify which degrees of freedom are soft and the ones that need to be scanned. And, um, and this is where the idea of, of the vibrational analysis might come into play again. So, um, um, so this is, again, an animated GIF, and, um, and, there, and there it is. So, um, um, and, and, here, and here the basic idea is that using the Hessian, you can automatically detect the soft degrees of freedom, either by projecting your vibrational modes onto internal coordinates or by translating the entire Hessian into, um, um, into the internal coordinates. And in geometric, we already have an internal coordinate system implementation that lets you do the molecular geometry optimization. And, um, and putting in second derivatives is something that we wanted to do anyway because we want to optimize the uh, transition states uh, as well. So this will have a, this will this will have some benefits in a, in multiple directions. And this is just an example of a molecule where a vibrational analysis appears to reveal you know um, a um, um, a softer vibrational mode that you might want to scan along when you when you're automatically generating your uh, your QM data set. Um, okay, uh, and then. Um, and then, how are we going to work with the um, with with the QC archive? So, um, so in my so my interactions with Daniel Smith, I've uh, I've developed a pretty superficial understanding of how a user interacts with QC archive. So, um, so so ba so basically, um, suppose QC archive contains has defined a workflow called minimize then frequencies. Okay, um, and um, and so if this workflow exists, then we can ask QC archive to execute it by providing a molecule and a quantum chemistry specification, and then. Um, and then, and then QC Archive will, will do the computation or retrieve an existing one, and then we will receive the minimized geometry and the Hessian and vibrational data. The next step is that, you can, is that we can locally run our internal coordinate code to detect the soft valence degrees of freedom. Um, and we expect this will probably be easier than molecular fragmentation that Haya talked about. That seemed to be a much more challenging problem. Um, and then in the, uh, and then in the, in the, 
In the third step, after we have identified which degrees of freedom we want to scan, then we can ask QC Archive to do that step as well, as, um, as long as QC Archive has that workflow precisely defined. And then we will receive the minimized um, structures and energies. Um, um, gradients are also really important. We will, we, we will get those on a grid, okay, so for, for fitting our parameters as well. Um, and, um, and here are the needed uh, software pieces to make, to make that work. Um, First, uh, um, first, the QC schema, which is basically the standardized file format for storing vibrational data, um, still hasn't been fully designed. And so, um, and so this, um, and so we just need to finish the design of that file format and um, and and decide what it needs to contain. Um, we um, we also haven't really decided how to specify a potential energy scan because, in a sense, um, this is a lot easier than than a torsion drive, which goes around. Um, because the torsional degrees of freedom are um, are much more free, right? You can go all the way around. Um, but in um, but the procedure is a little bit different now because we no longer have the wavefront propagation, and we are going to mainly be propagating around a minimum. So there's some questions there. Um, and then um, once we have precisely defined the workflows we want, um, they can be implemented into they they can be implemented into QC archive. And the, the way I understand it is that the um, is that the definition of the workflow takes a long time because it takes a lot of meeting and planning. But once it's been designed, then the implementation seems to happen quickly. Um, and then um, um, and then there needs to be some codes that automatically downloads and converts this data into the force balance native formats that can be used for parameter optimization. Um, and I think that is the end of my part. So back to you, David. Thanks, Ping. Yeah, so um, it's quite a bit to do, but um, once it's all in place, actually refitting, we think is going to be straightforward. Here's one example of a sample uh, angle refit that I think Li Ping did in, I don't know, overnight or a few minutes or something the other day um, over break. So basically, it will be you know, pipelining whatever molecules that we end up with. We'll go through conformer generation and, and the workflow for... Um, scanning and then force balance for refitting and so we're going to be focusing on parameters that we haven't tested very much and or are identified as particularly problematic or informative um, so if if so both both things we draw from um, Vicky and Caitlin and Jordan Ehrman's work or things that you highlight in your own testing but because the, the largest part of this first phase is just getting the infrastructure working so we want to make sure while we're getting it working, we actually provide some value at the same time. Um, and so, and we can already do this for for selected parameters. This is an example in dimethylamine, where basically the the, the original force Smirnoff ninety nine frost force field um, around the nitrogen, the angles are too stiff. So you see that the mm energies are are high, and then after a quick refit of those, we end up with the orange. Um, so that should be straightforward. At the same time, though, we're also going to be working on concepts for fitting of impropers. Um, and this seems to have largely been neglected in at least the forcers we're familiar with. This is GAF's impropers. You might notice there's only two, really. Um, there's 10.5 or 1.1. Um, and they're only used to ensure planarity. And we think they actually should perhaps be used more broadly, um, for example, for partial planarity. So, we're um, starting to work through that. One thing we're particularly interested in is nitrogen. So if you look at, here's a small set we've put together. And this is um, Jessica Mott. Can you wave your hand, Jessica? So she's working on this aspect. Um, so she's working on this set. And this is work actually Vicky did just before uh, Jessica started. So this is looking at the sum of um, angles around the nitrogen center for this set of molecules and the, and the nitrogen we're talking about is highlighted. So you have pyramidal near the bottom and planar near the top and then you have this intermediate gray region where things are neither pyramidal nor planar. And so depending on what chemistry you're looking at you can go relatively smoothly between pyramidal and planar. And so we would like to do a better job treating that in the force field you know, currently as at least the force fields we're most familiar with, all nitrogens are either pyramidal or planar, never anywhere in between. And they may disagree about which is which, but you never have anything in between. And that obviously should not be the case. And we have some longer term plans that can actually allow us to modulate more smoothly between pyramidal and planar um, that we could talk about. But 
Um, yeah, so there's a range of geometries, and right now, either that was exciting. We, for us, we'll treat them as either or, but really there should be a range that's possible in between. And so we think with suitable and propers, we can we can basically get the right planarity for almost everything and, and go smoothly in between. So um, we're going to be using geometric to work on that, and this is something we're sort of getting this these concepts in place while working on the more traditional bond and angle terms. So what we want to do is take a diverse set of small molecules with a range of parallelization. We'll be perturbing the improper's and the, the corresponding angles, compute geometries, and then fit new force field parameters with force balance and to figure out what we're going to need to be doing on these more broadly. So to give you just one quick sample, here's one case we've looked at already. Um, so we're looking on the left at the energy as a function of improper angle. And so we have the quantum energy there in blue. And what we get with Smirnoff 99 Frost in red, which is rather similar to what you would get with um, GAF or similar. So uh, this is a case where GAF basically makes it planar. And Smirnoff 99 Frost is similar. Uh, so we, Li Ping just did a, a bit of um, geometric, a scan with geometric, and then Jessica refit this with force balance. And so after refitting, we have the purple, which basically overlaps well with the MM. So this is an intermediate planarity case. So it has the two minima and um, is indeed intermediate planarity after refitting. So this is just one molecule and one molecule done in isolation. So these aren't general parameters. We aren't going to be using these parameters across a whole set of molecules, but that's sort of what comes next as we head towards seeing how generally we, how generally we can do this. Um, and so we think this is important because we certainly care a lot about nitrogens. So generation one is developing those concepts and then generate and fitting bonds and angles, selected bonds and angles. So then generation two will be fitting all the valence parameters we have while maintaining the existing chemical perception. So basically, same thing as generation one, but more broadly. Um, so we're going to need to ensure we have a broad molecule set that has adequate coverage of every parameter, which is an easy thing to check. It's a substructure query language. So if we have, have parameters that aren't being exercised, we just query the databases and pull more molecules that exercise that parameter. And you can contribute your fragments of interest. I think there's probably significant, we could probably also use a lot of the torsion, frag torsion drive fragments as molecules that we make sure we cover. That's a logical place for synergy. synergy. Um, and so generating sewing quantum data for all the molecules and fragments and using force balance to refit. And so at this point, generation two, we would begin fitting a significant set of impropers because we should have the infrastructure built out for this. And then generation three is a full valence refit with data-driven types. So Caitlin talked yesterday about chemical perception, um, automating chemical perception. So we're starting off with just having the types we currently have and then expanding those as needed. Generation three would be starting over from basically scratch and learning which types we should have in a data-driven manner. Um, and so the types will be now driven by data rather than either legacy types or expert-generated types. So to kind of summarize, um, we are using minimized geometries, vibrational, we plan to use minimized geometries, vibrational frequencies, and our energy profiles, potentially also Hessians in fitting these. And we can already refit selected parameters without any headache, just using force balance directly and doing things locally, but we're building out a lot of infrastructure to make this really large scale and automated and reusable and reproducible. So, and then there's a, quite a bit of interesting science to do relating to impropers, I think. So, um, acknowledgement. I don't have Jessica up here, but she's right there. So she did some of this. Um, and Jordan is also not there, but he's an undergrad volunteer in the lab who's done this millions of molecules uh, minimization project. Um, and on Slack, this is the valence channel, if you want to talk about it. So I'm happy to take more questions there. We have about nine or so minutes before break. Is it break that's next? Yeah. Um, I'm told it's on. Oh, there you go. I don't know. Um, 
harping back on the frequencies versus um, Hessian, the um, you're probably going to have what hundreds of thousands of frequencies, and so there will probably be thousands and thousands that are uh, improperly matched by accident or whatever. And so if the goal is to get to something that is closer to a turnkey production of a force field from a given set of quantum data, um, then that um, putting in the effort to fit the Hessians instead of the frequencies sounds like it's going to be, uh, as a pragmatic matter, if not for scientific matter, is, is going to be pretty important. The other, the other issue, um, Li Ping mentioned that you really want to fit the lower modes uh, more carefully than the others. But you can probably achieve what you want there by uh, by uh, increasing the weight on the one four Hessian elements. Leaping, you want to address that? Um, let's see. I, I, under, I understood the first. Give your microphone. Hold your microphone. Right, 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 right. My, my mic is here. Yeah. Just uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I so I understood the the first part. I might ask you to to repeat the the, the second part. But um, so I guess so I guess re regarding the first part. Um, my uh, the um, my experience using the vibration target is that the vibrational modes are never perfectly matched, and then there's a right. um, and there and, and there are two ways to match them. The, the the first way is you solve the assignment problem, and then and every and every MM mode does get matched to every QM mode in the way you know it's the combinatorial optimum. But but um, but you but you get certain modes that really overlap very very poorly. Uh -huh. um, and your and your objective function turns out to be very rough and hard to optimize. The uh, the other um, the, the other way is that you simply um, is that you simply match the MM mode to the QM mode that it overlaps with most. And in that case, you get between ten and twenty percent of the MM modes that get um, that like get mapped to the same QM mode. Um, and uh, and and again, like that is that that's certainly imperfect. But in but in practice, uh, you know, we've um, we found it to work when we um, when we don't rely on the vibrational data alone, you know, we, we are doing this in conjunction with a, um, with a lot of, with a lot of, uh, other data such as the potential energy scans. And it does tend to be along the soft modes where the vibrational assignment performs worst. Right. Which is, which is where you're most interested, right? Uh, right. So right. the, so the other issue you're doing the, um, you're calculating the frequencies on the force field version at the QM structure. Is that right? Uh, no, we minimize with the force field. It is minimized. So you're, up, so then you're comparing modes of two slightly different structures as yeah. well, which is maybe it is an additional confounding factor. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I, I think that, I think that a lot of, um, I think that a lot of this, working is predicated on the MM and the QM giving you, um, giving you optimized geometries, optimized geometries that are very close together. If you get, um, if you have very significant RMSDs between your, um, um, like between your QM and your MM geometries, then this certainly won't work. Or like if you have like two different protein structures, you know, it's definitely not going to work. Right. But again, if you, if you were fitting the Hessian, you would fit at the same structure and then there's no issue of whether your, whether your uh, structure shifted from one to the other. And it's a, you, you know, there's not going to be artifacts put in by that uh, structure shift. Um, like if there's a soft, especially if there's a soft potential. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, right. That's right. It makes sense. That the Hessian should be um, should be fitted using the same structure, not different ones. Mm. Um, I guess I have a, you you touched on this, and I probably missed it at the beginning of the talk. But um, what are your thoughts on integrating this with the Leonard Jones terms? Because everything is going to change, I imagine, when those change. Yeah, and so. Maybe this is almost a question for John, but the, the sort of big vision is that everything gets fit all together in some sense. So we have these sort of infrastructure building phases and then there's a parameterization sprint where everything's fit in a coupled manner and then test it. Okay, so it sounds like uh, take a shot with existing Leonard Jones parameters yeah. for the, uh, the first generation term. won't, we, we aren't doing Leonard Jones refitting quite yet. So it's just going to be changing some of the, the existing valence. Right? Go go so we could, we could probably do a lot of 
tuning of these methods independently, right? Yeah. But then put everything together. And the whole point of the whole project is to be able to integrate everything together and optimize concurrently all of the different components. One thing we do have to talk about, which we haven't brought up yet, is what about one fours? Um, uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to do the same thing that everybody's done in the past? Um, because that that's one of the primary means of coupling between those. And the more we can decouple them, the more e easier it'll be to go back and forth between different components. Yep. Any thoughts or people passionate? <laughs> and not, I, I'm passionate about the one fours, but not, uh, my question is not related to that. So uh, with regard to the impropers, um, it seems like there's often a lot of overlap between impropers and other dihedrals that are in that ring already. Yeah. Right. And so when, when I was fitting dihedrals, I never really bothered with impropers thinking that they're, they are kind of like constants, like you've pointed out, but there's dihedrals on top of them that are doing pretty much the same thing. So do you have any plans since the rest of Smirnoff is all about culling excess parameters to reduce that dimensional space? So, I mean, I think, with the automated chemical perception, we should be able to ask how many impropers do we really need? And, and in fact, there's three right now in total in the whole force field. So, and you know, because of, well, they're mostly in aromatic rings. Although these are cases, notice none of these are cases where it's in ring. Uh, Chris and then Arnie. Um, so going back to the one fours, um, I think there's been very good discussion homing in on what's this issue of the coupling with the one fours. And I just think we need to be aware that um, this problem is even worse than it initially appears because a lot of the um, uh, density calculations and bulk liquid calculations focus on the distant part of the one four dominated by the one over the R to the sixth term whereas the internal energies, particularly for sterically congested structures, which I think will be instrumental in helping us tune um, the, the one fours in the repulsive part, because they will be going up this barrier in the repulsive part. This is also going to be the dominant factor in the one four, with the one four uh, van der Waals as well. So I'm just, you know, I think what I, it is wonderful that we're aware of the issue and that we know we've got to try and solve this issue and we might have to think carefully, especially since we're bringing such diverse bodies of data to try and use to co-optimize uh, yeah. these, these potential functions. So if we had unlimited time, we would clearly have a breakout session on one force and you and Dave would lead it. Um, Arnie, you had something? It would take several years to solve that problem. With it. Um, but by, overlap, by overlapping the frequencies, I assume you mean taking the dot product uh, the eigenvectors, yeah. okay. and uh, one of the ways you might address the correlation between out of plane and portion is by using some of the more uh, some of the more rigorous forms of uh, out of plane coordinates, such as the um, Wilson Dicius and Cross, or the one we proposed, where it's the distance. If you take the distance out of the plane of the other three yeah. atoms, you're almost... Yeah, I think I'd like the distance out of plane better than what we have right now. It's mathematically, it's easier to. Just as far as test molecules, obviously you're going to have a whole set of these as you look at these. So um, I guess it's like in the urea case, you might want um, bis aryl ureas plus the mixed aliphatic aromatic ones and then with the degree of um, electron withdrawing in your ring. So you can probably come up with a, a limited set for those, but still be able to cover it and make sure that yeah. it works well across the mix. Yeah, that's, that's mix where we want to head. As well. Yeah, 